Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Cyber Risk Management Essentials for the Practical CISO. Today's featured speaker is SANS Senior Instructor and Managing Partner at Cyverity, James Tarala. If during the webcast you have any questions for James, please enter them into the Q&A window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing in the next 48 hours and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to James. Thank you, Lauren, I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate everyone being here today. But we, we have an opportunity today uh, to talk a little bit about uh, risk management. And I know a lot of you have probably heard some of my webcasts before. Uh, this isn't the first one that I've had opportunity to do with SANS. Uh, and so what I what I wanted to do was start thinking about uh, specific topics related to cybersecurity risk management uh, that, that we could share uh, to help people who are practitioners in the field to just practically make sense of this topic uh, and make it a little bit more digestible. So uh, this is going to be one of hopefully um, quite a few more of these. Uh, I'll talk to you about at the end of the webcast when the next uh, presentation is going to be. Uh, but myself and others are hopefully going to be presenting more on this topic, really just to give you some practical ideas of how to actually do some of the things that you hear about all the time. Uh, as Lawrence said, uh, I've had the opportunity of working with organizations like the Sands Institute for a little over 20 years now. Uh, so I've been doing this for just a bit. And, and so it, it's good to have an opportunity to maybe take some of the research that we've done, uh, some of the new projects we're working on, uh, and share them with you today. So that, that's really my hope. Uh, throughout the webcast, if you have questions or you have things that you want to maybe talk a little bit more about, uh, one is certainly you've got the Q&A window. I would encourage you to use that. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't have the chat up. So if you're trying to send me chat messages, I probably won't see them till the very end. Uh, but also you'll see that my email is here on the first slide uh, and it is at the very end. So uh, definitely looking forward to hopefully answering some of your questions and, and working through that today. So looking forward to talking to you a little bit more about some of these. I'm also going to shut my video off just because as I tell everyone when I give these presentations, I tend to be a pacer. And so it gets to be a bit distracting for everybody, including myself. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that off for a bit. Um, we'll come back here maybe in a little while. The uh, the first thing I want to say about some of these, these webcasts, and, and this one in particular, is uh, this I, I really have sort of designed this one to be more in line with a fireside chat. I I know I've, I've been told a few times that when I give these presentations that that's sort of the vibe that I'm giving off, and I don't know if that's on purpose or not, but but I, I, I want to have an opportunity to have a conversation with the people who are listening to the webcast and, and share some of the things that, that, that I've learned, that some of my uh, coworkers and other SAM professionals have learned, uh, and, and just try to make this topic a little bit more digestible. Uh, this is one of those topics that probably most of you, you know, myself included, have heard about my entire career. And... There are topics that are covered here in words that we use that just aren't clear. And, and so it's something that I want to take the time for us to talk about. Uh, I want to give you a framework for this. Uh, I want to talk about actionable next steps uh, and, and get you thinking about how you can integrate this into the way that you work, uh, hopefully to make your job a little bit easier uh, and possibly a little bit more effective in the process. And so that's something that we're going to do. Where, where I want to start today, though, as far as getting into our content, is, is trying to understand a little bit about the, the current reality uh, of where we are. Is, you know, I, I know when I started my career in cybersecurity, I, I really thought this would be a short term event. Like I, I started this probably in the late 90s, early 2000s is where I really started getting going in the field. And, and I know I, I kind of had this mindset that that I would work in cybersecurity for, I don't know, maybe five or 10 years, and then vendors would get their act together and uh, start solving some of these challenges and start setting standards for themselves. And, and the nice thing would be then we wouldn't have to worry about things so much. Well, you know, obviously that perspective was wrong. And, you know, here I am 20, 25 years later, and we're still facing a lot of those same challenges that we were facing 20, 25 years ago. And, and don't get me wrong, I think we've definitely matured in a lot of ways. But the reality is, is that this, this, uh, this issue that we're facing of addressing cybersecurity threats doesn't seem to be slowing down. I feel like it's becoming more definitive how to respond to those threats. And I think we're getting more, um, it's becoming more of a science and less of an art uh, as we move forward in our field. But the reality is, is if we look at some of the research like by IC3 and others, you know, we see that the number of breaches that, that we're learning about continues to rise and actually continues to rise exponentially uh, year after year. And, and what we're finding is that there's disconnect in, in people who are trying to solve these problems. Specifically, what I'm seeing is cybersecurity teams 
frankly, are prioritizing cybersecurity above everything else. Uh, the, the people I know in the field are um, very, uh, very adamant, uh, very excited about the, very passionate about uh, the idea of cybersecurity, uh, and want above all things to defend their organizations, which is admirable. Right? That's not something we would we would definitely discourage in any way. But the flip side of that is we have these business owners and these business teams, whether it be you know executive leadership teams or others, who are prioritizing the goals of the business above all else. And if we're if we're just frank, they they see oftentimes pieces of the technology budget, and especially the cybersecurity budget, as inconvenient and possibly even a cost center, not something that can be used as an advantage in the organization. So our field often, you know, when we talk to these business leads, really is that we're an expense, not a value to the business. So you've got these two different opposing forces, right? One, which is saying, hey, cybersecurity is more important than anything. And the business gets probably aggravated about that and says, no, the business is the important piece, but we can't just do the business. And there's got to be a way that we partner to find a way to combine these topics. And I don't know that either of the groups is to blame for this mentality, uh, but I do worry that cybersecurity teams have lost sight of the business purpose of cybersecurity and that the business team may have never actually known what that business purpose was. And so what I want to talk about today is the idea of risk management. In fact, I'll throw in some governance methodology sort of on top of that. But I feel like this is the opportunity we have to bridge that gap. It doesn't mean that culturally we're necessarily going to solve every problem, but I feel like if we have the opportunity to use governance or what we might call program management for cybersecurity in the context of risk assessment, risk management, we may have some opportunities to address something. So let's go ahead and kind of start there. So if we start in the sense of cybersecurity's purpose is I, I like, I, I want us to take a minute and actually think through this. I, I, I know I wanna give you some skills and, and talk about risk management today, but I, I guess I want to make sure that we lay a foundation with this webcast and that we set the stage and really level set of, of where, where we should be as professionals in this field. And if I wake up in the morning and I'm trying to understand why do I exist as a cybersecurity professional, at the end of the day, our teams are enablers. And if I could get really specific, cybersecurity teams are enablers of technology teams and technology teams are enablers of the business. That's why we exist. The, the reason we wake up in the morning is to make sure that the technology systems our organization has chosen to use continue to help support the business and the things that they're trying to accomplish. You know, said very simply, uh, I can remember when I was younger, uh, when my um, my family's company, they owned a, a manufacturing company uh, in southwestern Michigan. And growing up, I remember them purchasing the, their first computer in, in the boy, late 70s, early 80s. And the reason they purchased that computer was to help automate their accounting practices. It's not that they couldn't do it with balance sheets. I, I remember my grandmother being a whiz at numbers and being able to add them up very, very quickly in her head. But the reality is it wasn't scalable. And so as the business grew, they had the choice. They could basically hire more people to do that accounting work or computers were just coming out and they could use those computers to become more effective and more efficient as a business and, and do their accounting using those systems. And that's what they did. And that's how a lot of organizations got started. And frankly, why financial services in many cases got a little bit of a head start uh, when it comes to technology and cybersecurity, right? It was because of some of those early reasons for those technology platforms in the 70s and 80s. So what happens is, is then that technology enabled the business to be more efficient. And back then, cybersecurity wasn't sort of a big issue. But the more it becomes an issue, the more we see these breaches and the more we read about threats and such, the more that we realize that cybersecurity is just simply an enabler of those technologies to continue to support the business in the way that they were designed. Or if we try to give a definition for this or something more succinct, we could say cybersecurity programs ultimately exist to support an organization's technology systems. So those systems in turn can enable an organization to achieve its purpose. We're ultimately supporting technology to support the mission. And, and that's why we exist. And I think it's important that we understand that now. Does that mean then that cybersecurity should be walked on? Does that mean that you know we should never have an opinion, that we shouldn't have strong voice you know, at, at the table as far as what we should do to help achieve those goals? Well, no, we should have an opinion, but we have to make sure that it's done in a context that everybody understands. And specifically, if I could actually say why 
uh, why we do this. I, I sat down a couple months ago to think, you know, beyond just, let's say, you know, the basics, how do we actually make sure that that enablement takes place? Uh, and I ended up writing a white paper on this. Uh, it's not out yet. Um, it's a part of a whole bunch of resources that are going to be coming out at the end of the month. And I'll share about more about that in a minute. But I wrote a white paper just sort of saying, why is it that we do cybersecurity? What's the business purpose here? And I, and I came up with basically seven main things that I thought were, were drivers. And, and I'm open-minded to other things. So if you have other ideas, please share them with me. And uh, we'll include them possibly in future versions or releases of the white paper. But the, the common answer, which I think we all know and is still definitely true today, is cybersecurity enables the business by providing confidentiality, integrity, availability of data. And I think those three things you know, that we've talked about for years and years, as long as I can remember, are still going to be important today. Uh, I might, the, only maybe, the only maybe difference I'd say is with availability, it's not just dealing with data, but we're also dealing with the systems that those data, that data resides on. So I, I think that C, I, and A, I think that those principles still are profound today. One could argue privacy uh, is a part of that. But I, there's a lot of debates, you know, is privacy a standalone pillar? Is privacy a part of confidentiality? And, and that's a debate I'm not going to try to deal with today, but maybe just a note you sort of put off to the side. I think also cybersecurity programs have the ability to help us with our compliance and regulatory requirements. And then I would add to that contractual requirements as well. If there are situations where we've been told we have to do something or we agree that we should do something. So again, think... You know, we've agreed to a regulation, we've agreed to a contract. If there's something cybersecurity related in that contract or in that regulation, then we can support the business by ensuring that we are in compliance and that we don't have negative consequences, or at least at a minimum that the business knows what their choices are when they make a decision to be compliant or not compliant with a particular standard or a particular contractual requirement. But I think compliance, you know, regulatory contractual requirements, that's another reason why you know, we exist or why we do our job. And I would say maybe hand in hand with that is the idea of liability. The, the discussion of due care and liability in cybersecurity uh, is gaining more and more steam. It, it, it's not just a conversation about insurance anymore, although that's certainly part of the conversation. But there's, there's more people I keep talking to about what does it mean to be to exercise, let's say, cybersecurity due care. What does it mean for an organization to be liable because they did not exercise due care? Where is that line, right? All of those conversations are starting to come up. And so I think it goes along a little bit with regulatory requirements, but there's so much confusion as far as what a standard of care actually is that I, I go ahead and list it as a separate purpose here. So I would say on the one hand, we can help the business by dealing with those regulatory issues, compliance issues, but we can also help the business by making sure we're exercising due care and therefore potentially avoiding liability that might come by you know, not addressing those issues. Uh, I would say maybe along with due care comes the idea of social responsibility and ethics. I know that, that topic comes out a lot um, again, what social responsibility means, what ethical business practices mean, what does it mean to be a uh, responsible and ethical corporation or organization? Uh, and, and that's a sort of a much bigger topic for today. But I think if we've been entrusted with data and whether that data is our employees, uh, workforce members, whether that's the, the people we work with, customers, you know, whatever that data might be, if we've been trusted with data, and we've been entrusted to keep that data confidential, and we've been entrusted for that data to have integrity that it can be used appropriately, then I think there's, there's some responsibility that we have to achieve those goals, to make sure that not just that we support the mission, but especially in terms of confidentiality, that we protect people in that process. Uh, and I think sometimes there's a disconnect that we forget about in our field that uh, we forget that we're talking about defending systems, that really at the end of the day, we're defending people. Uh, and, and many times it's because it's people's information um, that we're trying to protect and, and that not protecting that data has consequences. So I, I think that's got to be a part of our mindset when we think about why we do what we're doing. The, the last thing that I identified here is the idea of customer trust and loyalty. I think the positive side of this is the better we are at our job, the more trust, the more loyalty that we potentially may have from our customers. Now, you could say it the opposite way, right? We could say, 
if we don't do these things well, then we have the potential to lose trust. And, and it's a complicated conversation. Uh, a lot of people in, in the context of risk management will talk about brand value or brand loyalty or um, brand risk uh, that might be associated with cybersecurity risk, uh, which is definitely true uh, that there is that potential for that to exist. But I guess I just wanna talk about it in the positive that if we're successful at our jobs, we have the potential to earn the trust and earn the loyalty of our customers. And there's a lot of ways we do that. Certainly cybersecurity by itself is not the only way that happens. But if we allow some of the data to be lost or stolen, then certainly that impacts this as well. So I think that's got to be part of our consideration, right? We we impact the business in a positive way if we can be successful with the way that we do our jobs. So if I'm talking with the CISO then, and I'm thinking to myself, so if you're a, the, the conversation I guess I'm hoping to have today is if you're a, a new CISO, and this is something that maybe you haven't thought of, or Maybe you're a long time CISO and the, the daily tactical things you have to deal with have, have forced you to sort of lose focus of you know what's really important. I, I want to refocus what we're doing. And I guess that's a fireside chat I want to have with everybody today is help us focus on what is it that, our, that we're really responsible for? Are we doing those things that matter, that bring value? Um, and sort of give us a North Star. And, and maybe even this is something, this webcast could be something that uh, we play to ourselves and even myself, or to remind myself why it is that we do what we do. I, I think there can be some value in that. So if, if you're a chief information security officer, and, and even if you're not a CISO, if you're a director of security or you, or you feel responsible for cybersecurity in your organization, I, I think there are things that we can do to help achieve these goals. But they, they require a disciplined approach or what, what I like to call eating your vegetable. A, a lot of the things that we're going to see here, they're not super sexy, but they're important and they, they help us to make sure that, that we're able to um, achieve those objectives that we defined already. And so, so let me sort of work through these and, and I'll give you some specific tools and tips and things here uh, as we go through it. So specifically, I think number one, I think understanding your organization's mission is a way that we can help do the things we just described. If you don't know why the business exists, I, I don't know how you support that mission. And so uh, people have asked me, you know, James, what do I do as a CISO on day one? And I, I've thought about that quite a bit. And I think one of the very first things I want to understand is what does the business actually want to achieve? Now, does that change you know, my decision making as far as do I want to patch my systems or not? Does it change my decision making? Should I address that high critical vulnerability that we discovered, you know, no. But, but I think it gives me context for doing all the work that I do. So I would say understanding your mission is a good first step. Secondly, I would say understanding your organization's technology stack. I would say the second thing I would probably do as a, a new CISO would be, I would go to I'd try to understand what exactly is the stack we are using? Um, what endpoints do we use? What operating systems? Uh, what server operating systems do we use? Um, do we have physical versus virtual? Do we have virtual versus cloud? Are we moving to serverless? What cloud service providers do we use, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, what business applications are core to the business? But make sure you understand that technology stack. I think that goes a long way also to understanding some of the specific defenses we'll get into um, later on in the conversation. Then I think it's important for us to understand cybersecurity safeguards that are possible to support the mission. And the, the reality is, is, and this is something for new CISOs or CISOs who have been around for a while, it's easy to lose track of the technologies that are available to us to be successful in this space. So I think having resources that we can go back to to understand what technologies actually work and actually make a difference in defending organizations, there's, there's a lot that we could do, but what actually works? You know, one of the, the challenges that I'm afraid of more and more, uh, at least in the last few years that I've been noticing, is, you know, if I'm honest, I see a lot of cybersecurity professionals who don't always keep up with those technologies that are available. And I'm seeing recommendations being made regularly for technologies that were amazing 10 years ago. But today, I don't know that they actually make a strong difference. You know, I'll just give an example. And I'm not saying we should all go home and rip these out. But... Let's say we have something like enterprise IPsec VPN tunnels or you know client-based VPN tunnels. You know, this is something that's been a traditional technology. We've used it for years and years, and it's amazing. And the purpose of those was to allow us to create encrypted tunnels so we could feel secure communicating back and forth over untrusted networks. Well, more and more we see organizations using transport layer security or TLS to achieve a lot of that same functionality. 
And so the question a lot of times I'll ask businesses is, do we need to rack TLS sessions with IPsec sessions? Then you know we can argue that offline at some point. But if if I'm saying to my organization, thou shalt do you know full client-based VPNs, just make sure you know why. I'm not saying it's an important, I'm not saying it doesn't make sense. There's probably a lot of situations where it makes total sense, but make sure you know why you're doing it. And let's not just do more because we're not sure what actually works and what doesn't. I think other things we need to do is make sure we're, we're involved with educating the organization's workforce. I think that's a big part of our responsibility. Uh, again, ultimately, it doesn't mean I'm teaching classes necessarily, but can I help sponsor or encourage education for you know, what our organization has decided is important for cybersecurity safeguards? So for example, you know, what safeguards have we set as an organization are important? Or what are, what are good best practices in cybersecurity? Or for a given role or responsibility, you know, what does an executive leader need to know versus someone on the incident handling team versus uh, a business owner of an application? Are we educating people to help them understand what does success look like and how can they help encourage that process? Um, then number five, I would say we can, of course, help, you know, implement appropriate safeguards. You know, we can encourage appropriate safeguards once we've decided and we know what's right. Uh, we can even help with that implementation. Um, certainly validating safeguards are in place is another thing that's a big part of our role. Uh, not necessarily um, always doing our own validation. I'm not saying we should be the audit department, but at the same time, being a part of understanding and validating that the safeguards are doing the things we expect them to do, I think is a big part of our responsibilities. And then I'd say the last thing here that we'll get to goal-wise is communicating the status of those safeguards. So making sure business leadership, executive leadership, engineers, that we're all on the same page of understanding you know, what risks are we accepting uh, because of lack of safeguards in given areas. And so what we've been, what I've been working on here the last couple of years is trying to come up with a model to really represent a lot of the things that we see here. And this year, uh, we actually had the privilege of starting a new organization for the purpose of sharing a lot of the ideas that we are working on. Uh, that website, which I'll give you the URL for this um, in just a little bit, um, is not live. So if you go there today, uh, you will not get a, a response. It's not going to give you any, any of the resources we're talking about today. Uh, we are going to go live with all of these resources uh, at the end of the month. Uh, we sort of promised that we would, uh, we would release everything uh, at RSA this year. Uh, so really at the end of April or right before the first part of May during the RSA conference is when we're going to go ahead and release all of these resources. So you've got to wait a couple more weeks. But I can still sort of share with you what's coming and help you understand some of the resources that are available. One of the things that we, one of the white papers, in addition to sort of this, this business value white paper I talked about, was we wanted to think about that governance cycle and really try to understand if I'm a CISO trying to manage a cybersecurity program, what are my responsibilities? What are the things I should be doing? And at first, what I had tried to do was think about this only in terms of risk management. And I'll admit, I've been sort of struggling with this for probably a good 10 or 15 years. And I think my problem was, was I was trying to think of risk management as a standalone activity. And what I've realized through the last couple of years is that I don't know that we can really have a conversation about risk management separate from a conversation about governance. Because what we identify is there are things that we refer to as risk assessment or risk management that are really just subcomponents of a whole governance cycle. Now, I don't have time and a half hour to you know teach every you know sort of bubble on this slide, and you know I'm happy to point you to resources as we go through this. But what you'll see is is the bottom line is pretty much the core activities of governance that, that we should be considering if we haven't already done these. And I'll run through them quickly. We should be doing um, program initiation, which involves you know getting executive support, creating a charter, all those things you'd expect, um, selecting what safeguards matter for us to be able to defend ourselves, you know, using those, those committees to help us with that, educate the organization to those items, form asset inventory to help us do prioritization so we understand what assets need what safeguards in what order, right? Where to prioritize limited resources. Then of course we can implement those safeguards, validate that the safeguards are doing what we expect, communicate residual risk at sort of the end of that process. And then the hope is the more that we do that in the long term, we'll reach levels of program maturity. But that to me, sort of that lower set of bubbles are the things that we're responsible for as CISOs, as people responsible for cybersecurity programs. Then we start to think about, okay, well, where does cybersecurity risk oversee this? 
then to me, there's basically two, two reasons why we do cybersecurity risk management. One of those areas is we do cybersecurity risk management for the purpose of safeguard selection. And you hear this all the time, right? People say, well, you know, why am I doing risk management? Well, I'm doing risk management because I'm trying to figure out what's the risk of not doing this safeguard or what's the risk if we don't have these safeguards in place. And, and that's a discussion of selection, of trying to decide which safeguards actually make a difference and help us to achieve the mission back to the business purpose. And then the other main reason why we do risk management um, which is where most of us spend our time, is validating that we're implementing or we've implemented the safeguards that we said that we believe we should be doing and look for gaps in those programs so we can make sure that we can communicate those to leadership and they can make better decisions uh, around those areas. So this is uh, what you see here. Uh, again, the organization we founded this year um, is going to be known as the Cybersecurity Risk Foundation or CRF. Uh, and this is the cyber, the CRF governance and risk model. Um, there's a whole white paper sort of supporting this, and uh, I hope in a couple of weeks you guys can download it and learn a little bit more of kind of you know what's looking at there. Again, these are all going to be free resources if you want to give to people. So again, if I sort of talk about you know where this intersection takes place, let me sort of get break this down a little bit more and give you guys a little bit more detail. But it begs the question, you know, how does the CISO integrate risk management into that model? And there's there's two main areas, and I'll say one minor area. The two major areas are what I stated before. We do risk management for the purpose of cybersecurity safeguard selection. Okay, how do we choose and define the things that we believe we should do to be successful? Okay, so that's one thing. Then the second reason why we do this is we say, we wanna make sure that we're actually doing the things that we said we were gonna do. And so we're gonna do this for the purpose of uh, safeguard validation as well. So we're gonna do sort of both of those. But there is sort of that asset management or that BIA place where um, we may want to make a decision to um, to rate or classify, let's say, uh, assets in the organization, objects we're defending. And then by doing that, that helps us to have sort of a little bit richer conversation about not just, let's say, should we address a vulnerability, but where should we address the vulnerability first? And so that gives us some capabilities there if we understand classifications of these assets. So we can talk about safeguard selection, but I'm going to do this one quickly. I'm, I'm doing this more as an academic conversation because the reality of the conversation to me is that if somebody asks you, should you implement patch management? Should you implement application control? Should you implement perimeter firewalls? You know, the answer is pretty much yes. But and, and that intuitively, you know, we know those things. But how do we actually do that? Well, the, ideally, what we would do is we would go through a process of, as organizations and basically say, okay, uh, what are the threats with the potential to cause us harm? Okay, let's, let's like go ahead and, and inventory those. Let's come up with for a way to score those, right? Do threat modeling, then do a safeguard inventory and map those together. That should lead to safeguard prioritization that we can then communicate to the enterprise. But the reality is, is nobody does it. I would love to say that, you know, the best 1% or 5% of companies in the world are doing this today. I would love to say that even the regulatory bodies or the standard setting bodies are doing these today. But the reality is, is nobody actually does these today, not even the regulatory groups. And trust me, uh, I've been a part over the years of uh, conversations with a number of these different teams. In fact, I, I won't say who, but I had an opportunity to talk to some of the regulators of, of one of the, the new popular standards a couple of weeks ago. And again, just validation that nobody's actually going through this process. So ideally, there, there will be a time where we start to do this when our industry becomes more mature. But as we're talking about risk management for the purpose of sacred selection, although this is academically the right thing to do, the reality is, is we don't. Now, if anything is going to sort of save us, though, if it's sort of if there's a catch in this, though, the other reality is that we are not as organizations, unique special snowflakes. In fact, I would argue that almost all of our organizations behave almost identically from a technology stack standpoint. And what do I mean by that? Well, reality is, is most everybody listening to this webcast is gonna use some combination of Windows workstations, Mac workstations, maybe a couple Linux workstations thrown in, but probably not most of you. You probably have servers that are a combination of Windows and Linux servers. 
Some of you are moving away from servers and more serverless architectures into cloud service providers. The cloud service providers you're using are primarily um, Microsoft Azure and uh, AWS, with some of you using a little bit of GCP thrown in too. At our boundaries, we have companies like Palo Alto and Cisco, and our switches are the same. But we don't have 50 choices of technologies. We're in a very narrow lane, and we all behave the same. And if that's the reality, that we all use the same technology, I don't care if you're a hospital or if you're a bank or if you're a hedge fund or it doesn't really matter, an energy company. Attackers aren't using exploits that are unique to financial services. They don't have zero days and exploits that are unique to energy companies. What they have are exploits that take advantage of flaws in software that we all use. And they're going to use those flaws to enact their code or run their code on your system to achieve their goals. They don't care how you use, say, Microsoft Windows. They just care that you're using it. And that's the point I think we need to remember is that then when we're doing defense of those systems, then if attackers are using the same attacks, which it turns out in many cases they are, and we're not special snowflakes, then maybe there's more continuity in the safeguards that we all would want to implement than maybe we like to think about. So maybe it's not that big a deal that we, we don't do threat management, you know, threat modeling all the way through safeguard prioritization, because maybe if we all have the same defense or the same systems, maybe using the same defensive stack is acceptable too. So reality is what most organizations are actually doing is they're simply going to the standards bodies and saying, we're going to do the safeguards that you suggest. Now, if you would have come to me five or 10 years ago, I would have said, the organizations that I talk to are going to align themselves with a type of, of framework. So you would be a NIST CSF shop, or you would be an ISO shop, or you would be a CIS control shop or, or whatever. But you would pick one primary standard, you would primarily report against that, you teach your board about it, you know, et cetera. More and more though, what I'm finding is organizations are being asked to do all kinds of standards. So you might say, well, I really like the NIST CSF, but I've got to operate in the state of New York, so I have to do NYDFS. And I also maintain credit cards, so PCI is always an issue. But I also have all of these third parties asking me questions. So I want to get an ISO registration and I want a SOC 2 type 2, so maybe they don't ask me as many questions. And now next thing you know, I've got seven or 10 or 12 of these standards that I've got to work on. So more and more what's happening is organizations are developing architectures to say, okay, I want to be compliant with these five, seven, 12, whatever standards. And that becomes what they do for defense. And then maybe they'll sprinkle in some other safeguards that they just think work, right? You go to a conference, you learn about a technology, you think the technology is cool, nobody's requiring it, but you think it's effective. And so you go up and you add that to your list. But that's kind of the summary. That's what most of us are doing. We take a combination of our regulatory requirements, we take a combination of our contractual requirements, and we sprinkle on top of that some of the cool technologies that we find. And that basically is what we're doing. But sadly, we just don't have a lot of organizations who have sort of the, um, the mental willpower to go through that threat modeling exercise that, that we mentioned before. And so again, so sort of talking about that multi-framework world, again, that's kind of where, where we find ourselves right now. Now, one of the other resources that, that, that I, we're gonna be releasing here in a couple of weeks is, uh, we've also been working on uh, a standard that we can use to help communicate how these safeguard libraries interact or overlap. Uh, as many as you know, there are dozens, maybe low hundred, maybe one or two, 300 of these things out there in the world today. Um, there's lots and lots of regulatory bodies, state governments, federal entities, international bodies, et cetera, all going out and, and saying, we want you to do certain good things to be able to have you know, a due care of cybersecurity defense to help organizations achieve their mission. And so one of the things that we've noticed is that more and more these, these standards overlap with each other. Uh, very rarely do we find situations where uh, a, a document's going to come out and be published that really says, here's a new thing that we expect you to do that none of the other regulations have talked about. You know, the argument is almost like, um, if you look at the, the cybersecurity framework, for example, uh, when they developed that originally, they actually had the mission. And part of the response was uh, NIST said that they wanted to be able to look at existing standards and do a public-private partnership and pull in safeguards that the private sector thought were important. 
And what that translated to is they mostly, you know, copied in ideas from the CIS controls and COBIT and ISO and 853 and sort of, you know, threw them all in a bag, shook them up a little bit. And next thing you know, you have the CSF. And, you know, that's sort of a reflection of even what we see today. Again, it's not a negative thing. It's just that's the reality. So anyway, so the, so my team had the opportunity over the last few years to kind of work on this. And so um, we're going to be releasing a new standard um, called uh, the CRF Safeguards, uh, where we've basically aggregated at this point up to about 80 or 90 different standards together um, into one common uh, library of safeguards to sort of show where the overlap takes place, uh, just to kind of make that easier for everybody. Uh, and the idea then that that will complement the CRF threat taxonomy. Uh, so we will be releasing a new threat taxonomy um, that we've created along with the safeguards themselves. So those pieces of the puzzle that I mentioned earlier that we don't see a lot of organizations doing, our thought was is we'll just release that to you as a template and give you free resources to be able to use that. Uh, that way it's an opportunity for you uh, to not have to reinvent the wheel, right? You can go ahead and use a lot of these yourself. Uh, and so the, you'll see the URL there for it, uh, crfsecure.org. Uh, like I said, we're gonna be releasing that here, sort of turning the lights on for it here in a couple of weeks. Uh, a lot of you probably heard me talk about it or present on it in the past and sort of warn you that it's coming. Um, but it turns out we, we will be going live as promised um, here at the end of the month. But the idea is that we're gonna be giving these as free resources for people, hoping that people will be able to use them um, to facilitate their programs as well. And there's going to be some bells and whistles and other things uh, we'll give away as part of that process as well. But those are some of the big ones. Um, you'll also see sort of a part of that too. You know, we, we mentioned we have about 80 plus standards that we're going to, we've aggregated into this library. Uh, you can see some of those that are here just as an example. You know, the, the idea of course has been, you know, all of those major standards that people, you know, talk about, we want to make sure are included. And, you know, I've, I've had people randomly reach out to me and say, hey, my regulator is asking me to do this document. Could you add it in? And uh, in many cases, my answer has been just yes. Uh, we have a pretty good defined process for how we add these in now. Um, we've moved everything from Excel worksheets uh, into a Dynamo DB database, uh, a, sort of a serverless architecture. It's actually quite simple for us to upload new standards into it. So uh, when we release it and we, we publish sort of the list of standards that are mapped, if you see that your standard's not there and you really want it to be, send us a note. <laughs> the only request that I make is uh, that there's a publicly available list of safeguards. Uh, I don't want it to be a commercial entity. Like there are some like high trust, for example, that we won't map to because again, they're commercial entities and it, we don't want to be in violation of any of the standards and the, the licenses that are out there. Uh, but the other thing I'd say is, is make sure that it's in English. Uh, I've had people send me um, international standards that are not translated into English. It's not that we can't, but what I'm finding is it's so, it's so difficult for me to translate and map that I'm probably not the best person to be a translator. So if you send me one, just send it to me in English, make sure it's a public document that I'm allowed to see, um, and we'll happily go ahead and add that into our standards list um, if you guys have a question for that into the future as well. Then the thought is then, if on the one hand, then the first part of risk management is defining these safeguards. Uh, and then a lot of what we're doing here, obviously, is we're trying to give away resources to make this process easier for you. Uh, that's something we're hoping can be crowdsourced. So if we said there's two major issues of risk management, two major goals of this program, and one of those is to do safeguard selection. The safeguard selection piece, we hope as a community, we can work together to solve that problem. And, and I think that we can. So we'll, we'll throw that out there that that's something that I think is solvable that we can all do together. Now, the other piece of that, though, is safeguard validation. Now, that part you're going to need to do. So if you're a CISO in an organization and you're thinking how I should be spending my time, my encouragement is don't spend a lot of time trying to figure out what you should do, but maybe spend some more time figuring out, are you doing the things that you believe you should do? And so participate then in that safeguard validation process. So if we say patch management is a good thing to be doing, are we actually doing that? We say application control is a good thing to be doing. Are we actually doing that and making sure that we have those things in place? It's also what I'd say is there's there's lots of sort of ways we could do this. And you know, depending on where you're at in your journey, I may encourage you to look at this in different ways. So if you're new to this and you're trying to decide, you know, should I do risk assessment myself? And should I do this control validation or control assessment or safeguard assessment myself? If you've never done it before, it doesn't hurt to do a self-assessment and ask yourself these questions. Because 
rather than paying an outside firm to come in or having an internal audit group surprise you, it, it might just make sense just to do this kind of assessment yourself and say, okay, where am I at? And use your skills, use your best knowledge to get a lay of the land. And especially if you're new, I think this would be something, you know, early in my role as a CISO that I would want to make sure that I spent some time with. I would say, I would want to understand my mission. I'd want to understand the tech stack, but maybe as a part of understanding that tech stack, I would want to ask questions about safeguards to say, hey, are we doing these things? Because that would allow me to figure out sort of a layer of land and say, okay, where are there major gaps that we need to make sure that we're addressing that process? Now, if that's not a skill set you have or you're not comfortable with, then maybe you want to get someone else's help or right? partner with internal audit, uh, partner with external assessors or others. Uh, one of the things that, that is coming a lot, uh, out quite a bit, I know I gave a presentation um, for SANS here recently on the risk assessment regulations that were coming out here the last um, last few months. There is a push more and more for there to be independent risk assessments performed. Uh, and so if you're a highly regulated organization, you, you may want to look at the standards that you have that, that you're being asked to follow. There's a good chance you're going to be asked to do an independent risk assessment. What I would be looking at in that sense is not the safeguard side, but I would be thinking, am I doing the things that are appropriate and making sure leadership understands that? So that's where, again, independence doesn't mean you have to go to a third party. If you have an internal audit group that's capable of doing this, that might be a great way to go. Or partner with your internal audit team and go out and find an external body to go ahead and, uh, and do that work for you, provide you the results. Uh, and that way, again, you've got independence and, you know, even the third party's perspective that you can bring to your leadership teams. So you know, you've got a couple of ways you can do that. And you know, certainly you could add pen testing to this if you're trying to get more into effectiveness testing or even tabletop exercises if you wanted to. But there's a few ways we can do that. Most often, though, what we're seeing is we're seeing organizations doing this via, you know, either internal or, or external formal audits. Uh, we're seeing quite a few organizations engaging in pen tests. Uh, and then some organizations doing control self-assessment. The thing I would argue, though, if you're going to do these assessments, a lot of you are starting to get to a mode where you're doing a lot of these assessments. And so the thing that I would probably encourage is uh, as you're thinking about what assessment should be done, try to come up with a long-term plan. And, and what I mean by that is don't just think about you know, what What do I want to do this year? But what are the scopes I want to cover in the next, say, five years? And, you know, I hear a lot of audit teams, especially especially internal audit teams that I work with, where they talk about doing audit planning like a year in advance. And so maybe, you know, October, November, they'll submit a plan to the audit committee. And then, you know, by December's meeting, they'll try to get that approved. And then they'll, they'll enact that audit plan during the next uh, calendar year. But I guess what I would love organizations to start considering is, can we extend that instead of a one-year plan to maybe a longer term, like a four or five-year plan? Because the thing I'm starting to see with organizations is people are tending to do the same scopes in these audits and these assessments over and over and over again. And so like an identity and access management review, for example, right? Those are very popular. And I'm sure a lot of you have gone through those kind of audits or assessments and they're great. Like I absolutely think that's something we should be doing. But if we repeat that scope year after year after year, and we neglect things that are harder, like say, for example, what if we never look at um, how governance is being done in software development practices? Or what if we never try to understand how code review is being automated in CICD pipelines? You know, those are very important topics. And if those haven't been assessed in the last couple of years, I would want to make sure that would be something that would be on my radar. So one of the things I think I would be thinking about here too, is I'd be thinking about, again, if I'm if I'm in the role of a CISO, not even getting into like internal audit or anything like that, although certainly auditors would benefit from this, I would be thinking about is someone assessing all of the safeguard scopes that I want assess within a reasonable period of time? And so maybe what you do is on the one hand, you say, let me inventory all of the safeguard scopes that I think need to be evaluated. So sort of come up with a list of what's everything that should be looked at at some point, then classify each of those scopes to say, okay, these are super important, or these are regulated, or these I can maybe wait a little bit longer in between the scopes, and then build out a plan to say, okay, you know what, I should probably do this assessment every single year. But this other assessment, you know, if I do it every three, four, five years, it's probably okay, but I don't need that to be an every year kind of scope. 
But then what that allows you to do is sort of map out over a five-year window, okay, what are all the things that I should potentially be doing? And what are all of the assessments that need to be done? That might be a good opportunity then to partner with, like, say, an internal audit department and say, okay, are you going to be doing some of these scopes? Mark those down, right? So that way, internal audit resources are being used for that purpose. Then find out, okay, are there external auditors or external pen testers coming in to do any of these scopes? Okay, mark that down. But then that means anything that's not being done by one of those is probably going to have to fall under the scope of a control self-assessment that you or your team or somebody you bring in uh, is going to have to do to sort of fill those gaps. But what it does is it lets you have sort of that comprehensive view. And so if you're trying to, again, build a risk assessment program, and the focus of that risk assessment program is safeguard validation, which is my argument, which is what most of us should be doing, then my argument is, are we looking at a comprehensive set of these safeguards, and or are we just looking at the same test over and over again? And not to pick on pen testers, but let's say you hire pen testers and you say, well, we're just going to hire pen testers to scan the perimeter every year, and they're going to scan our public IP spaces. You know, that's good. That's valuable. And maybe that's something you want to do every year. But when do they look at your databases? When do they look at your mainframes? When do they look at, um, let's say, lateral movement capabilities, right? Where do they look at your defense against phishing, let's say? But all of these are things that you'd probably want to include somewhere in that pen test scope. So just make sure that you've got a plan for all those things. Now, one of the things that we did to partner with the CRF safeguards is many of you who have been sort of following my webcasts over the years and um, seeing some of the tools that I've put out is, you know, I've created tools for like, you know, measuring yourself against the CIS controls or, you know, other safeguards that might be out there. So one of the things that I want to do is um, now that we've got this new safeguard library that, that we've created is I wanted to make sure that we had tooling that you all could use uh, to go ahead and evaluate that. And we've, we've made a couple changes to the way that it works. Uh, we, we really had sort of a, a heart to heart with people on the team to say, you know, what's the best uh, venue that we could use or modality we could use uh, to give out these assessments. And, you know, as much as people fight it and as much as people, you know, make fun of it, I still believe in my heart, one of the best tools we have to be able to do this is still Excel. And, you know, is Excel perfect? By no means. Uh, but I think using Excel is still one of the simplest ways for us to evaluate ourselves and say, are we doing the things we know we should do? Because we don't have to learn something new. We're not learning an engine. Like we're not learning how the CMDB works. We're not learning how a GRC engine works. We're not having to set this thing up, but we can very simply answer questions. And the answers to those questions can direct us to you know, where we need to be spending more time. So we are still going to continue to give away our Excel tools. Uh, this is something we're going to continue to do probably well into the future. Uh, I don't imagine us stopping. Uh, people can make fun of Excel all they want, but at the end of the day, it provides very useful data that leadership teams can use to make decisions. And that's why we do what we do. The other thing though is uh, you will see this year, um, within the next couple of months, um, we're going to enable uh, a web version of the same tool. Uh, again, it's pretty much already working pretty well. Um, it's sort of in a, I guess, an alpha testing phase right now. Um, but once we put it through a few more, um, few more uh, tests and things like that, uh, we'll go ahead and release that as well. Um, Excel, as many of you know, is a little bit limited in the sense that it only allows you to do one assessment at a time. Uh, it's tough to like compare, you know, assessments year over year or things like that. And so we realized that by putting some of the same data into an Excel-based tool, that we would have, or I'm sorry, into a web-based tool that if it's in a database, we can start doing comparative studies um, and things like that to help people understand their progress over time, um, to help you with better benchmarking and things like that to make that a little bit easier. So um, stay tuned, uh, but more of that's to come here uh, later this year. But then you can just see just a screen capture of you know, following up on um, the CRF safeguards and using that as a model. Um, you can just kind of visualize that Excel tool. Um, the output looks a little bit different than some of the assessments you've probably seen us um, release in the past. One of the big changes that we wanted to make uh, as we're giving out uh, this new model is, you know, over the years, you know, people have really been focused on uh, five-point maturity scales. And as many of you know, and the Excel tools you know have done in the past, you know, we we often would put those five-point scales in there. But what I realized is that more and more organizations that, that they relate to that leadership teams relate to that maturity concept. So what we did was um, we, we partnered with some organizations uh, to go ahead and create a maturity model. 
nothing against the Carnegie Mellon model. I think the Car Carnegie Mellon model uh, for maturity has been sort of a, a stalwart. It's been great for a lot of years. The, the only thing is, though, it's not highly cybersecurity focused. Uh, it certainly is applicable, um, but I would say maybe not as focused. So one of the things we did is we also created a maturity model, uh, which we'll be releasing here in a couple of weeks. Uh, again, just simply called the CRF maturity model. Uh, and we did create a five level model. The thought being that we wanted to identify what are things that organizations are doing just simply very, very basically today versus what are those cyber hygiene principles that we know are super effective and actually work. And then versus things like governance controls, advanced controls, monitoring controls, things like that. And, and start separating those a little bit more based on where you are in your journey. And so our hope is that if you're, again, you're a CISO trying to figure out, you know, you've done these assessments, now what? You could look at a result like this and say, okay, I see in the bottom right, my maturity score for level one is almost a five, but really that should be a five. Like what will it take for me to make that a five? And you could figure out where your gaps are and your expectation should be that yes, everybody should get a five on level one. And then if I'm not a five on level two, which probably most of us won't be right away, that gives us a list of things to say, okay, next then let's figure out what does it take to be a five on level two? And you can go into the tool and figure out very quickly what's missing just using filters. And the nice thing is, is hopefully you can use something like that as a roadmap to decide where should I focus my energy? And this goes back to sort of the concept of eating your vegetables that you'll hear me say all the time. So again, you can still have an overall maturity score by looking at our, our tools. But the other thing we want to be able to show people is where are you, you know, where are you doing well? Where is your maybe a little bit more granularity, let's say, uh, in the way that we present that. So again, um, this is a free tool, uh, very similar to some of the other free tools we've given out in the past, a little bit different um, sort of interface and things like that. But I think for many of you, it'd be very, very similar. So again, at the end of the day, we use these tools because we want to be able uh, to present risk to stakeholders. We want to gather evidence of risks or you know, say gaps in our safeguard libraries, um, act as an advisor regarding how to address those gaps, educate people about those, maybe even track those. You know, if we're talking about the Institute of Internal Auditors, many of you know their three line model. Basically, the, the role I'm referring to is sort of that second line of defense. But you can kind of see how quality sort of makes its way in there. But all that being said, the thing I would always emphasize to people is at the end of the day, while our job is to report on these, our job is not to sell stakeholders that cybersecurity is important. You know, I've heard that so many times in, in my field. People will ask me, James, you know, how do I sell my executive leadership team on cybersecurity and convince them that's, that it's important? And you know, the, the best illustrations I have, there's two illustrations I give over and over again. And one of those is, it's not the job of a doctor or a physician to sell health to their patients. If a patient isn't going to consider, say, their own personal well-being and health, a doctor is probably not going to be super successful to do that. Or if you're a chief financial officer in your company and you feel like it's your job to sell profit to the company and convince them, hey, making money is a good idea, is that really the kind of role a CFO should have? And I'm going to argue that cybersecurity professionals are in that same position. If, if executive leadership teams don't believe that defending their technology platforms helps enable the business, I'm not sure you're going to be super successful, especially in, in a year like this, where it's been so many breaches and so many high profile cases. If leadership teams don't understand the impact that these things can have, that literally their entire business systems or technology platforms could go down for extended periods of time if they don't address this successfully, then I don't know what you're going to do to convince them. But so it's your role to report to them, present risks to them, and help them make good decisions. Be a trusted advisor. That ends up being your role. And all of these things we've talked about all up to this point, the hope is, is that they sort of aggregate or lead up to the ability of you being a trusted advisor. And one of the better webcasts that SANS has, uh, it's a little bit older, it's going on a few years old here now, but uh, the founder of SANS, Alan Poller, uh, while he was still alive, um, partnered with John Pescatore, formerly of Gardner, and they presented a, a really good presentation on what is it that senior leadership teams really expect from their cybersecurity teams. Uh, and you go to a link there, uh, you can go ahead and, and get a link to it, or you can search it in the, um, the SANS webcast portal there. 
But long story short, if I summarize it for you, they said they want to know that you're a trusted advisor to, to them and the leadership team. They want to know that you're competent. They want to know that you're giving them good advice. And they want to know that you're someone who's efficiently, in a trustworthy way, helping the organization meet their cybersecurity goals. They don't want to know all the details. They don't necessarily care how you do it. And the analogy they said was, it's like going to a mechanic. Some of you don't want to know how your car works, and that's fine, right? I'd argue maybe you should learn a little bit about that too. Uh, but at the end of the day, many of you just don't care, and that's okay. But what do you want in a mechanic? You want somebody who's trustworthy, someone you think is going to be efficient, someone who's not going to cost you too much, but help make sure that your car starts in the morning when you have to go to work. And, and that's really one of the best analogies I've seen when it comes to what our role is. Leadership teams want us to be trustworthy and efficient and help them achieve their goals. So again, if you haven't listened to that webcast, I, I would put that on your short list. That might be a good one for you to listen to. It's been around for a while, but still a good one. At the end of the day, though, again, this fireside chat, right? The reason why I wanted to have this webcast was I, I wanted to just do really just sort of a foundational level set and say, why do we do what we do? What's the point of us in, in our roles as CISOs? What are we trying to accomplish? How does risk management overlay that? And I wanted to be able to make that as succinct as I possibly could. Now, granted, there's a whole bunch more detail we could go into and so many more of these topics, but I wanted to at least have that foundational conversation as a webcast that we could refer back to and all have conversations about as we do this. Our role is to be an advisor. And the hope is, is that if we adopt a governance cycle that risk overlays, we can use that to effectively, clearly communicate where risk exists in the organization. I also hope that you realize as you go through this, that you are not the only CISO possibly going through some of these challenges. Uh, all the organizations I talk to, everyone's facing the same thing. There aren't snowflakes right now. People are trying to accomplish many of the same goals. There are some very good CISO communities out there. SANS is a great resource. Um, and there's others as well, but you know, get yourself into a community of people that you know can help you solve some of these challenges. You know, and I hope my team is going to be able to release some of these resources to many of you too, um, that maybe makes your life a little bit easier in that long term um, as well. I want to leave you with your resources to think about here as well today. Um, we don't have a lot of time to be able to do question and answer. So if you guys do have questions, what I'd say is, um, maybe just go ahead and, and email me. Um, the, my email is, is in uh, the presentation a couple of times. So I'll give that to you again here in just a second. Um, but as a resource, again, put in a note in your calendars here in a couple of weeks, uh, crsecure.org. Um, SANS is a partner with us too. So uh, this is sort of a, is a complimentary uh, community resource. Where we're hoping to give away quite a few free resources to people um, and build a community of people who can work together to help solve some of these challenges. Uh, we do have some courses. Um, SANS has this, the LDR 419 course. Um, I've had the privilege this, this last year of taking some of the research I've done over the last couple of years and um, trying to just basically start fresh and write a whole bunch of new content um, to help people understand uh, some of these risk issues. Uh, so the 419 class is a brand new class that I wrote uh, just maybe a couple of months ago. Uh, and this summer, we're releasing a new course, uh, the 519 course. Uh, which would be sort of a longer five-day version, um, but sort of also doing more, whereas 419 is more of a how to perform a risk assessment course. The 519 goes into a little more of the philosophy of risk and uh, sort of those bigger picture risk management issues. Um, if you're looking for a book to read, the other one I might throw on your list there too, um, is the How to Measure Anything, uh, Finding Valuable Intangibles in Business by Douglas Hubbard. Uh, I don't always agree with everything he has to write, um, but Hubbard has some good perspectives on measurement. Um, he has a couple other books, The Problem of Risk Management um, and um, Cybersecurity Risk Management as well. So you've got a few books there, but if you haven't read his first book, that would be one I'd maybe put on my short list just to make sure you sort of understand some of those resources. I would like to give you some takeaways to be able to read a little bit more. We're also going to make this um, one of uh, many. Uh, one of the things Sam was great to do this year is they, they partnered with us to um, schedule some of our webcasts uh, months in advance. Uh, so we're going to be doing these all year. Um, at least one quarter uh, to try to give away topics um, that we think are interesting to everyone. Um, the next one we're going to give is I am going to do a longer deep dive into the idea of threat modeling um, based on that model we talked about earlier, that thing I said that nobody really does. I'd at least like us all to talk about it and understand what we should be doing and maybe just you know uh, open the conversation up for folks to understand what that might look like. 
provide some templates. So if you all want to tweak that process or use some of the community resources around for that, you would have those available as well. The, the last thing I'll leave you with, uh, just as we're about to time expire here, um, you do see my email address is listed. Um, uh, so james at severity.com. Uh, so if you want to reach out, please uh, reach out. I'm always happy to answer questions you might have. I know the SANS team um, is going to be posting this webcast though. So um, if you're looking for a copy of the PDF or something like that, um, rather than email me, just trust the SANS team. They're, they're going to be posting this here very soon. Um, and also give them a, a couple of weeks uh, and they'll try to get up on YouTube as well. So they'll have all those resources and SANS will be more than happy to help um, provide those resources as well. But I appreciate you all being here today. Uh, it was great to have everybody on the webcast. Uh, again, hopefully you'll look at the SANS webcast calendar and see some of the other um, good webcasts that are coming up here soon. Uh, maybe even uh, join us in July for the threat modeling webcast as well. But appreciate you all being here today and hope to see you on future SANS webcasts. Thank you so much, James, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. And to our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org slash webcasts. And you can find your CPEs for all completed webcasts by logging into your SANS portal account, navigate to your account dashboard, then click My Webcasts. You can then download your CPE on the right-hand side of the web, web page. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.